Good afternoon to you. Mark Soto, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your off-season edition of the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion for the 10th day of January, 2017. Let's begin today's tour of what's happening in the world of tropical weather in lower 48, potential winter storm weather, with a gander at the Southern Oscillation Index. Today's value, negative 1.13. The 30-day value now, negative 6.3. And that's really, you know, 16 points or more off the highs here from October and November. And the 90-day is now averaging at plus 3.7. What does this mean? Well, when it's negative and strongly so and consistently so, then you can change the pressure pattern so that the winds are more from the west down here, westerly wind bursts. And any warm water that's residing over in the western Pacific helps to get upwelled towards the surface, and you get this El Nino that tries to develop. That is, if one of the many factors that we watch, these numbers here are strongly negative. And while we have had a good negative downturn as of late, it's impossible, and I'm going to show you about this in a minute, to know if this will continue or if we will level things out and just have neutral conditions in the equatorial tropical Pacific region. Right now, this fairly solid La Nina is in place. The North Atlantic quite a bit warmer than it should be. And as it stands right now, like I said recently, I think it was in last week's update, this is a favorable pattern for Atlantic hurricanes. But it's January. It's not August 8th or September 8th. As this map shows, today, of course, the 10th of January, you know, we can just simplify it and say it's not August 10th, it's January 10th. So uh, looking at the wide shot of the Atlantic Basin here as a uh, part of the rest of the globe, of course, very warm in the North Atlantic, like I mentioned, colder here in the South Atlantic, the La Nina sticking out very prominently. And we just have to see if the Southern Oscillation Index and the whole state of the El Nino Southern Oscillation Phenomenon down here in the tropical Pacific starts to switch to one that favors more westerly winds or just what, you know, and we don't know for sure. So that's why I like to do these updates once a week. It gives us something to talk about, but honestly, we can keep track of this. And this is not a forecast. This is what's happening. And we can look at what's happening and try to deduce some short-term thoughts about what may happen down the road, certainly not five or six months from now. I don't think that's very helpful, and I'll show you some evidence of that in a moment. All right, the Gulf of Mexico, actual sea surface temperatures. This is really fascinating, as there's the 26 degrees Celsius isotherm right there. Basically, the water temperatures are close to 80 degrees Fahrenheit all through this region in here and all down in here, and I've really never seen it stay that warm on into the new year. And uh, there's still the chance that we could get some Arctic intrusions and what we call cold air advection moving down here and sort of chopping this off. But, I mean, the last one that we just had that brought the giant storm, the big winter storm, I call it the Great Blizzard of 2018. Uh, Weather Channel has a name for it, but whatever. I mean, that was, if, if you didn't cool the golf off very much with that, <laughs> I don't know what it's going to take. Um, in the meantime, the western Atlantic and off the east coast, some of this up through here is cold enough for icing. Believe it or not, and if you live up there, you know uh, the bays, the rivers, and lakes and uh, areas up here, retention ponds, a lot of them frozen. Even down here in Wilmington, North Carolina, where I am, temperature got down to 11 degrees, the coldest since 1996. And yes, our retention ponds around here uh, were frozen, many of them. Some of them you could walk out on, even a heavy guy like me. So this is what it looks like in the western Atlantic. You know, very cold here along the continent uh, because of all of that Arctic air. But if we go back and visit the anomaly map, you can see, for the most part, the western and northwest Atlantic, and then again through the main development region here where it matters during hurricane season, quite a bit above the long-term average. Now, why don't the forecasts, the, the computer models, I don't want to say they don't matter for, for seasonal forecasting, but... I'm going to show you Tyler Stanfield's page. Uh, he is a OU meteorology student, and he is researching, I'll highlight it for you, tropical weather and climate teleconnections for seasonal forecast improvement at OU. 
So, you know, you got to say this guy knows what he's talking about, and he knows what he's looking for. And that's important. And up-and-coming scientists, so here's a pinned tweet of Hurricane Irma. But here's what I wanted to show you. All right, so this is a retweet from Tyler of Sam's tweet here, and I don't know how to say his last name, so I'm just going to skip it. But look at this. All right? So let's see if we can open this in a new... No, it's not going to let me open it in a new tab, and if I open it, I'm going to lose the Twitter page. But I think you can see what I'm showing. This is mid-March 2017, and these were the El Nino predictions, all right? And everything was up for the most part. And then here's what it looks like now. <laughs> so there you go. That was mid-March last year. El Nino was coming. And we are in a heck of a La Nina, moderate to maybe almost strong La Nina in some cases. So that's important to note. And that's why I don't trust uh, these models this far out. Because, I mean, come on, when have they really nailed it? I think we have been thinking there was going to be an El Nino in the upcoming hurricane season every summer or every winter or spring into summer since 2012. So I just like to look at what we've got and go from there. And that being said... This is interesting here, and I will click on this, and it should open it. There we go. So, Tyler, talking about what I'm showing you here, too, the storyline to follow will be this very warm, anomalous North Atlantic. The entire basin is well above normal, which would bode well for an active Atlantic hurricane season if it were to continue. How do we know if it will continue? We don't, but we can watch this. You know, we have Levi Cowan's data, you know, well, the map interpretation of his data, uh, from Tropical Tidbits, we can look at the Noah Nesda stuff, and we can watch this ourselves. But I'm telling you right now, ladies and gentlemen, this is the area, I mean, I know the main development region matters, but this is warmer than normal. And so the, uh, the AMO, as I transition over here to Dr. Phil Klotzbach, somebody else who knows his stuff, the AMO uh, is standard deviation um, 0.3 above the normal okay so it was quite high this is 2014 let me just scroll down a little bit and you can see that a little bit better if this will let me come on don't be shy it's not letting oh i've got an arrow sitting over there one day i will know my software 100 percent. so we go and look and see you know this is from 2014 and the amo had a good spike and then it just fell off the cliff for a long time and then rebounded and then had some back and forth but as of late at the end of 2017 the trend has been up see that I mean I'm not making it up it's there unless somebody's just lying about the data you know I mean you, you trust it and so there it is a slightly positive AMO what does that mean well that means that the Atlantic overall the multi multi-decadal oscillation it oscillates or changes between warm and cold, usually over many decades. And we are probably, and you can see the evidence here, still in a warm AMO. Also, the Mary O'Donnell mode, and this is a little harder to explain to you, is uh, second highest December value, I think he said, since 1950. And what in the world does this mean? Well, basically, here's North America. There's Africa. There's South America, warm, cold. And if you know your tropical stuff, warm Atlantic over cold South Atlantic, or warm North Atlantic to be specific, this is another generally classic setup for a very busy hurricane season ahead. And some of the years where it has been this warm over cold, the, prior, the previous, I'm sorry, the subsequent hurricane season, 2005 is one of them, but to be fair, and I don't want to quote a certain news network, but fair and balanced, yes, 2013 was also one of those, so you never know. There were other ones in there, too, that were very, very busy. I think 1999 was one. Um, so these are things that we watch, all right? And that's why I spend this time on it. This is what I look at. And so since I can record this and show it to you, I figure we can look at it together. All right, so there you go. Um, so now, transitioning to lower 48 weather, we will revisit all that tropical stuff every week until hurricane season. Wow, what a start to the new year it has been, that giant storm system. Uh, the big nor'easter, the big blizzard of 2018 has exited the building. It's out of here. And so what do we have now? Well, 
more action developing here in the plains as this system that came in through California comes out into that region, taps some Gulf moisture, meets up with the Arctic boundary that's still in here, and yes, we're going to have some big problems. Already had some problems and unfortunately fatalities in Southern California due to the mud flows. That was absolutely inevitable. Um, people were warned about it, and I just I don't get it. When you know that you're sitting at the base of a hillside and the orographic lift there, uh, and it's bare naked because of the fires and it rains that much and you don't leave, uh, I, you know, I guess it's why people stay when there's a storm surge warning. I mean, it's, it's, it's tough because you don't want people to get killed by the weather. I mean, come on, we can see this stuff coming generally days in advance, and it's really hard. But anyway, I digress. We had some fatalities here. That's tragic. It's preventable. Now this system's moving out into the plains, and we're going to have uh, a big ice storm problem up through here, and even into the New Brunswick area, into um, southeast Canada. You folks, some of the worst ice storms ever have seen up in South Ke southeast Canada uh, from that Arctic air where you have accretion of an inch of ice. Think about it. Ice an inch thick accreting around power lines and trees and so forth. So this is a problem. This is what it looks like now. You know, go to weather.gov tomorrow and Friday and watch what this map looks like. You're going to see a lot of ice storm warning uh, all up through this region here, the Ohio and Tennessee valleys in particular. And we can see that outlined here on the GFS. This comes from Levi Cowan's website. Uh, this is the lower 48, east coast of the U.S. I'll outline this for us to keep up with it. Here's California and the Baja of Mexico, etc. So here it is, 24 hours. So this is valid Thursday morning. And here is the ice and some snow on the extreme backside, maybe even blizzard conditions in some cases. And this is what it looks like 48 hours. So this is Friday morning. Yuck. Oh, I mean, come on. You guys in western Tennessee, southeast Missouri, northeast Arkansas, all the way up through portions of the Ohio Valley into the Great Lakes. Remember, this is moving. So this is just a snapshot at uh, 7 a.m. Eastern Time Friday morning. And then finally by Saturday morning, oh, horrible conditions in the northeast. Perhaps freezing rain, sleet, but the freezing rain is the worst. Uh, and then look, 1050 millibar high. So I can circle that. Dropping out of, you know where, Canada. Reinforcing shot of huge Arctic high pressure moving down into the lower 48. And this storm system out in front of it. Going to bring miserable conditions, power outages, and dangerous driving. I mean, ugh, forget it. I don't like ice at all. That is a true waste of weather, in my opinion, as an ice storm, because it's extremely dangerous. It's extremely destructive. It's a little bit pretty to look at, in my opinion, but it's like, eh, I'd rather have 30 inches of snow than an inch of ice. So finally here, 96 hours out, Sunday morning, high pressure is sinking in over Missouri. Uh, Monday morning, that slides east, and it's cold again in the uh, eastern two-thirds of the United States by day five. That holds on through day six as another shot. 1042 millibar high, circled, circled, centered over almost the Four Corners region, if you want to call it that. Call it that of Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, and northwest uh, Missouri. And then finally at day seven, if I can click on it, um, that high uh, slides over to Kentucky, so a chilly morning coming up for everybody waiting for the school bus. A week from today, 60-something degrees outside my office now. A week from today, probably only in the 40s. That's winter weather for you over the lower 48 in an active period like we are in. Huh, at least it's not boring. Well, we covered a lot today. And again, keeping an eye on those temperature profiles in the Pacific and in the Atlantic, I think it's going to be the key. I think it goes without saying, so that'll give us something to do. Now, in production uh, notes, the first chunk of my documentary covering last year's hurricane season is, for all intents and purposes, finished, all the way up through Harvey. And I'm going to put a clip to kind of give you a teaser on YouTube probably later tonight. So look for that. You'll see it, you know, as it upload, uh, as it posts. So if you're subscribed to my channel, you'll get a notification, a uh, two or three minute clip showing, you know, again, just a teaser. Um, I'm going to keep working on this thing. I still have to get through Irma. 
in terms of field mission material. Uh, a little bit from Maria, though I was not in Puerto Rico, it would be the impacts on the North Carolina Outer Banks, which were minimal compared to Puerto Rico, certainly. And then, of course, uh, we have Nate, uh, which was very successful in terms of all of our field operations, and then kind of tie everything up. Harvey was, I think, the longest, and Irma will be pretty long, too. But as you'll see, I put a lot of work into this, and I try to make it uh, as interesting and as, uh, as storytelling as possible because I have as much time as I need. I don't want to make it boring, but I don't have to be constrained to 45 minutes because it's a television show. And this will end up probably being over two hours long. So I'm going to put a clip, just a little teaser to kind of show you how far I've come in, a, in one of these neat little transitions. You'll see. So look for that this evening uh, on YouTube. All right? Thanks for watching. I do appreciate it. If you're not subscribed to my YouTube channel, go ahead and do so, and you'll get notifications in the future. And um, we do these discussions until hurricane season, and then they basically become daily. So have a good rest of your Wednesday afternoon. Thanks again for watching. I'm Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com. I'll talk to you again early next week.